Hello, so, hello, Professor Agri. Uh, so, what was the challenge uh, that you had to face in your research, and uh, how did you solve that problem? Well, the challenge was to make anything work ever, and the answer is sometimes things work when you least expect it. Mm -hmm. our, our discovery of the Acapulco water channels that brought the Nobel was a serendipitous observation. We were not even looking for this. We were studying the rhesus blood group antigen in red blood cells, an important blood group antigen. And we purified the rhesus for the first time and a contaminating molecule came along of similar size. And we were curious, so usually scientists solve, they have a problem and they find the answer. We did it backwards. We found the answer and then we had to find out what the problem was. And I can't say I took personal leadership. I talked to many scientists and they gave me good, good ideas. So we were very lucky. Right. So the curiosity is the key, I guess. Oh, absolutely. That's the one irreplaceable part, curiosity. So uh, that's great. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to ask is like, uh, what are the challenges you had to go through within your life and uh, how did you basically tackle those things? Uh, sure, no, that's a good question. So I've been married now. I met my wife 40 years ago this month. We were married in wow. <laughs> 1975. We have four children and a scientist salary, mm -hmm. relatively low salary. <laughs> So how do you have a life and a career? And this is actually a very important issue because scientists are not just technology-based robots. They have loves and interests and hopes for the children. So my, my wife chose to stay home when the children are small. And I would try to help out, but I was working a lot. But every year we would take a family camping trip in the national parks. Because that's one thing we were very rich in in the United States, these beautiful natural park, national parks, are open to the public. So we took the kids camping in Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon. It was very fun, very popular. And after doing this a few years, Mary, my wife, said, we should ask, ask the children which national park they want to go to next summer. So we asked the kids, and they immediately said, Disney World, <laughs> which happens not to be a national park. <laughs> On the way back from a trip to Disney World, and we did visit the Everglades, by the way, oh, and okay. Disney World. On the way back from that trip, we stopped in North Carolina to visit some friends. And there's a conversation with one fi friend who was a scientist that first suggested the new protein we discovered might be the water channel, which is being looked at by physiologists for a century, and no one had ever found it. So that is an example of a family and career mesh. Wow. <laughs> If you didn't take the kids camping in Florida, visiting Disney, maybe someone else would have discovered the water channel. For <laughs> that is unique. Really that is pretty interesting how the two things come together because generally it's always like a struggle kind of thing, like making a balance out of it. But that's like a unique Well, I could think of other examples of times that the family made it possible for me to do something scientifically. I did one sabbatical my entire career, only one. Mm -hmm because I had trained as a medical doctor and as a membrane biologist doing protein purification, but I'd never done any DNA technology. And it was clear early in my career, unless I developed some DNA technological skills, I couldn't continue. And it was a uh, visit to a, a PTA ice cream social where I took my little girl, six years old, and she pointed to her friend Gracie and said, that's Gracie's dad. That's how I met Steve McKnight, worked in his lab for a year, developed DNA cloning skills, cloned Acaporin 1. So they're, they're not separate. I think our lives as family members and scientists, they're, they're linked. That's actually a very good point, and I think it's, it's also inspirational for us that these things are not separate and that we should actually like tie them together for you. Yeah. Very nice point. Uh, so uh, based on what all you learned, so how do you want to inspire young generation? What message do you want to give? Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, it's difficult now for funding. And this is unfortunate because science is so exciting. The technologies have advanced so we can do some amazing things at a time it's discouraging. 
because the careers are not made easy. So I, I feel one of my duties is to share the joy with the young people, to encourage them that the system will get better and do everything I can politically to improve the system. You young scientists are our future. <laughs> You're very important to us. So I think it's, it's, it's a task I, I'm very happy to attempt to fulfill. I mean, uh, that's actually a very good point. Uh, and so, what actually like inspired you to basically do all these things? And I mean, it's it's a it's a big thing. You are co totally committed to one thing, and so it, there should be a huge inspiration behind it. So, what was well, your inspiration? It's a good question. My um, growing up, I was one of six children. My father was a chemist, PhD, University of Minnesota, and he always encourages to pursue science and technology. My mother was a farm girl, no university training, very well read, concerned with doing good for the less fortunate. So the, the two of them kind of inspired my interest in medicine. So I came to science because I wanted to be a medical doctor, sort of impure motivation, but whatever gets you through the door. So I think my parents were very inspirational. One individual that I met though when I was young was one of my father's friends and that was Linus Pauling, the great chemist. Dad did a sabbatical at UC Berkeley when I was nine years old. He had the opportunity to go to Caltech or Berkeley and he was corresponding with Pauling because he knew him from the American Chemical Society Education Committee. He ended up going to Berkeley, he remained friends with Pauling, he stayed at our house. And so the example was set early on that Here's an outstanding scientist, Nobel in chemistry, also an outstanding humanitarian peace Nobel. They're both important. So the, that was really inspiring. I still, still take energy from it today. It was actually 60 years ago this year that Pauling visited us. So, I, so it's like, I mean, uh, the, the already the Nobel laureates were, has been your inspiration, and then yeah. for us, like, um, the, well, I, mean, I hope you're not disappointed because <laughs> <laughs> I consider myself a mini Nobel. <laughs> no, no, I mean it, it's like I mean at least like especially here when you meet so many Nobel laureates, it's like such a motivation for all of us. So I guess it's like it's like a great thing. But is it true? I, I've heard like uh, from your students in general that you are very nice, and then it has some influence that uh, you you got some less grade in your. Uh, oh, I didn't care. I didn't like care that. about my is grades. That, uh, stu uh, okay. When I was in high school, mm -hmm. it was a time of the a lot of turbulence. The Vietnam War was at its height, and I got involved in student politics, and I wasn't too concerned with my grades. But chem chem chemistry, my father thought, was very important. I, I think it was a little rebelliousness. It wasn't a lack of ability. But in fact, I did get a D in chemistry. <laughs> Just to irritate him. But he got back, he pretended not to notice. <laughs> he ignored it. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, either way, like, it, it could either be a motivation to basically do well, or if it's not, then probably, like, for him, it's like, okay, so... Well, I, I think there's a lesson also, the system is forgiving. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're imprinted at a certain age because of a certain exam, you can't do something. Mm -hmm. So, I, mean, I studied hard to become a doctor, and interest in tropical diseases, third world diseases got me into the lab, and things worked in the lab, so... You don't have to be perfect to do something important in science. In fact, very few scientists are perfect. None that I know. <laughs> Even Linus Pauling wasn't perfect. I think that is that that actually is a very good motivation for all of us. It's like some people think like you have to be you have to do well for, at every stage, but I guess that's not true. It's like you always face challenges and then you get better. Uh, well, I think it's that. it's good to do as well as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like you should aspire towards mediocrity no, and then have some miraculous right. event. There's On the other hand, uh, th there's a point where you'll never know everything. When is when is it enough that you could do something practical?
the good message for all of us to basically get an inspiration. Um, thank you so much. Well, you're for welcome. Your and let, let me thank you for coming to the United States to do science. <laughs> thank you so much. It's good for you, it's good for the U.S., and it's good for India as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, Everyone it's a, benefits. It's a great opportunity for me to be basically come here and then um, work with such nice professors and then also like the young researchers that I work with. I think it's, it's in general like the very diverse environment in U.S. in general is pretty awesome to work. I, I feel that way. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.